Hello, good afternoon, welcome. I'm uh, Angie Hobbs, I'm the Professor of the Public Understanding here at, in the uh, Philosophy Department at Sheffield University. So, uh, does this work? Yeah, democracy and demagoguery. In the last year, a lot of uh, words have been tossed around which absolutely cry out for philosophical analysis. Patriotism, nationalism, sovereignty, will, representation, identity, people, uh, control. And I'm going to concentrate on one of the most contested of these, which is democracy, because I've noticed that both in the uh, referendum here in the UK and also in the American uh, election, each side both at the time and since has been claiming that they're the ones with democracy on their side, they're the ones supporting democracy and so on. So there's clearly huge disagreement about what's going on. A couple of uh, definitions. Uh, democracy rule by the people from uh, demos and kratos in ancient Greek. Uh, to be distinguished from demagoguery, uh, rule of the people, often meaning manipulation of the people from the words demos and agoge in ancient Greek. However, though the origins of these two words lie in ancient Greece, I'm not going to be concentrating on the direct uh, democracy of ancient Athens. I'm going to be looking at the kind of liberal representational democracy that arose in the 17th and 18th uh, centuries um, and is based on theories of uh, civil rights championed by people like Hobbes and Locke. Not that they were particularly democratic, but they do uh, kind of really work on these theories of civil rights and later on the theories of universal human rights uh, which uh, philosophers such as Thomas Paine and others are instrumental in forging. Who are the people? Uh, does it mean everybody in the state or group? Absolutely every living person in that state or group. Does it mean the electorate, those who are eligible to vote? Does it mean those who actually did vote on a particular day? Does it mean those who voted on a particular day and won? Uh, so you will notice when you hear this phrase, the people it means can mean any of these things, depending on what's useful to the speaker on the whole. Now, casual equivalences between the people as a whole and all or some of the electorate are really dangerous because they imply that those who can't vote or those who can vote but didn't vote, or those who did vote but lost, are somehow not really part of the people, maybe not even properly persons at all. It's very, very dangerous to make an equivalence between the people and all or some of the electorate in that way. Who are the majority? Another very problematic issue, particularly if there are more than one party to vote for, well, you can often end up with the party, you know, has got something like, I don't know, 32% of the vote, but they're running the country. That's usually what happens here. It can be uh, tricky if you have, for instance, a difference between the popular vote and the electrical, sorry, the electrical, the electoral college vote. <laughs> electrical college might have made more sense. Um, so, but anyway, even if they're on a particular day, there is a clear majority to who voted for one option, Nevertheless, it's obvious that on a different day, maybe the next year, the next month, maybe even the very next day, there would have been a different, or could have been, a different majority vote for two reasons. One, the constituency of the electorate itself can change. Uh, some people will die, some people will become in, too incapacitated to vote, uh, other teenagers will come of age. My now 17-year-old was particularly annoyed she wasn't able to vote in the referendum. Uh, also, individual voters, this is the second reason, could change their minds. So there are two basic reasons why a majority vote on a particular day might be quite different, even a fairly short time later. The more the vote is supposed to influence future time, the more either or both of those likelihoods uh, can happen. So if it's a vote for four or five years, you're going to get some people changing their minds, you're going to get some changes in the electorate. If it's a vote for decades or for all time, you're clearly going to get massive uh, changes in the electorate and changes in people's 
views. But there can't just be constant voting and co consequent changes of government and policy. It would be total chaos. There'd be complete administrative breakdown. Uh, that would uh, put off investors. It would make economic growth uh, very tricky. So we normally do a trade-off between genuine majority uh, wish and economic and administrative stability. And so we, we agree. I say we agree. I'm not sure anybody's really asked us. But we say we agree to have elections, say, every five years or so. And in theory, democracies themselves could take a democratic decision to have a vote only five years or so in the interests of stability. I'm not sure we've ever actually been asked, but there we go. However, the fact that we do this trade-off should not uh, alter uh, the acknowledgement that throughout any life of any parliament, for instance, or any government, there will often be very long periods of time when the government in charge is not what the majority of even the electorate want. So we just need to accept that that is part of our current system. Now, that does not alter the validity of a vote on a particular day. Uh, unless, and the, this is the only moral, I'm not talking about legal exceptions, I'm talking about moral exceptions, unless it can be shown that the vote on a particular day was the direct result of lies and misinformation and misrepresentation of facts. And that's really difficult to prove. So the vote on a particular day is what it is, but then one has to accept that very often people might change their minds or the constituency of the electorate will change. So if democracy means rule by the people, very often the majority of the people are not getting what they want. That's just how it is. A bit more on rule. Is rule really no more than ticking a ballot box on a particular day? Or is the ballot an important part of an ongoing conversation, a conversation in which all the electorate, both winners and losers, can have a voice, and indeed those of the people in the broader sense who maybe are not yet eligible to vote can have a voice. Um, I would argue that the intellectual foundations of our liberal representational democracy, uh, the intellectual foundations and the theories of civic and human rights of the 17th and 18th centuries suggest it's the second option, that democracy is an ongoing conversation in which all people, even outside the electorate, can have a voice. Each individual person has the right to a voice and the right to be heard. That is part of the theories of civic rights and human rights, the individual voice on which our liberal democracy is supposed to be based. Uh, even if we just restrict this conversation to the electorate, it's crucial to emphasize that each individual ruler, if we're all rulers in the electorate, if each individual ruler acts on his or her individual choice or will. And this is the second reason why the phrase, the will of the people, is so dangerously deceptive. Sorry, deceptive. Because it suggests that the people are not a diverse collection of individual and diverse wills, but a homogenous mass with a single homogenous will. So it's a very, very dangerous phrase, the will of the people. We've already seen that it exclude, it tends to exclude everybody who couldn't vote or everybody who even not on the winning side from being part of the people. Uh, this is the second. And this not only disrespects the basis of human and civic rights, it also allows an unscrupulous uh, demagogue to claim that only he or she can truly understand, channel, and represent the will of the single people, the single folk. Uh, now, what does this word rule mean? What is real rule in this conversation? Plato, uh, one of my favorite philosophers, makes a very interesting and controversial claim that rule, true rule, can only take place uh, if the ruler or rulers act from accurately informed, deliberative, rational choice and not just from a momentary whim. And Plato adds that those who act on unreflective and ill-informed whims are at risk of being manipulated by opportunistic demagogues who gain power through democratic mechanisms, as Hitler did, through referenda, 
illegal in Germany ever since, just saying. And then, as we have seen, by claiming that only they truly understand the will of the people, they then subvert democracy into tyranny before the people realize what's going on. That's Republic 8 and 9, a really interesting analysis. So what might help us become better informed choosers in our electorate, real rulers, real rulers, real autonomous rulers, freedom of expression, free press, access to internet, I think are all crucial. And I would say, and of course I would say this, really good education and particularly, I think, education in the arts and humanities. Um, I'm going to plug philosophy, my subject, but all the arts and humanities, they really help us reflect on these questions and what kind of society we want to live in. They are absolutely crucial for the protection of liberal democracy in these turbulent times. Thank you.